Everybody, how are you? Can you hear me in the back there? Okay. So, special shout out to anybody who's here from MCC. Anybody here? Any MCC? Yeah. All right. Um, firstly, uh, so many thanks. Uh, thanks to NYU Prague um, for hosting this and making this possible. And NYU New York, as we now have to call it, uh, actually funded my travel, which was great. And of course, obviously, to Andrea and everybody else who's at Art World, um, who's translated and published the book in this beautiful format and arranged this event. And to all of you for coming out on a chilly midweek evening into this, into this space. I, I really appreciate it. And um, what I hope to do for you this evening is a kind of overview of where I think this field, this critical endeavor, this project should be going now. And Andrea mentioned that the book was written in 2015. And I think it's had certain, a certain continuity, a certain staying power, because the conditions that it saw and it envisaged are those that continue to determine what is clearly a, a developing crisis in our social order, in our politics, and indeed in our planetary conditions of living. So I want to sketch that out for you a little bit this evening. I'm going to show a lot of images. I won't go into a great deal of depth uh, in each particular topic because I want to give you an overview. Uh, and if you want to get more depth, then you need to buy the book, um, which will be available outside. So uh, to, to, to begin, let's think firstly then about where, what kind of moment this is. And I want to think of this moment in, in the footsteps of a man who was my teacher, a man called Stuart Hall, who founded Cultural Studies in Britain uh, a number of years ago. And when we first started thinking about visual culture, we thought of it as, uh, in some ways, the application of the ideas that have come out of cultural studies to the new culture of the image, if you like, that was emerging in the 1980s and 1990s. But the moment we're in now is closer to the moment in which cultural studies itself was formed. What Stuart identified in the late 1970s and early 1980s was the formation of what he called a new conjuncture. A conjuncture is the coming together of politics, economics, ideology, uh, I would now say media rather than ideology, uh, and culture as a whole. And so there are relations formed amongst them. They're not given, they're not eternal, but in particular time periods, they become extremely influential and powerful. So the moment that Stuart was analyzing was the moment uh, that has sometimes now been called neoliberalism or that politics that was identified with Margaret Thatcher, particularly in the UK, called Thatcherism. And in that moment, the dominant theme was the preeminence of the market, of what came to be known as free market economics, that the market should always be listened to, as it were, and should always get priority over almost everything else. Our current moment is not that. And that's, I think, the real difference between what's happened post-2008, which this book begins to identify, uh, and the preceding now very long period from the introduction of neoliberal economics in Chile in 1973, right the way through to the financial crash of 2008. We're in a moment now where the dominant issue seems to me to be the political in the broadest sense, rather than the economic. And you see this in a number of ways. You know, the chaos that's going on in the United Kingdom right now uh, of Britain attempting to leave the European Union has no economic rationality whatsoever by neoliberal standards. If you see in the United States Donald Trump putting tariffs and other forms of barrier to free trade, which are exactly what neoliberalism said you should never do. So clearly the political takes priority now uh, over the economic. And so we're in a new conjuncture, and this is what Stuart said about that. When a conjuncture unrolls, there's no going back. History shifts gears. The terrain changes, you're in a new moment. So that's the moment we're in now. We're in this, uh, uh, it's not Stuart's moment, but it's our moment. A different and I think highly dangerous moment, one in which we have to think about how we might use 
the opportunity that it also is, and this moment of transition is also an opportunity. The key issue that's at stake very clearly then is the defining of democracy. But we need to understand that what's really at stake here is who counts. In other words, democracy is the rule of the people, the demos. Who are the demos? Who gets to be within the demos? I'm showing you here then the origin of such discussions, the Athenian assembly of the fifth century. But it's important to remember that in the Greek assembly, only a very limited number of people were given access. No women, no enslaved human beings, nobody who was not Greek, no one who was a child, and so on. And so really, by the time you analyze that and you go through it, only about four or five percent of people constituted the demos. So democracy was never the rule of the people, if you understand the people to mean all people. In fact, it means a highly constrained number of people. That was also true in the founding of the United States. We were very clear in the framing documents. If you look at the Federalist Number 10, for example, Madison makes it very clear that he is not in favor of democracy if it means the rule of all the people. He was particularly worried that people wouldn't pay their debts, which might resonate with those of you who are still students. <laughs> so we're in a space now, then, where it's very clear that not all people get to be the people in democracy, whether that's the illiberal democracy that's been framed nearby in Hungary, or indeed uh, what's going on in the United Kingdom, where they're separating precisely on the basis of trying to exclude people. The, free the, the freedom of movement is what is anathema to the current regime, and in the United States, where we're building walls to keep people out. So in, that, in this circumstance, in this moment, we find a variety of new circumstances that are generating that. So, this is a very different world. This is not the world that visual culture came into in the 1980s and 90s, let alone that described by John Berger in the 1970s. Most people live in cities. Most people are under 30. Most people have internet access. Now, all of these things are new since 2008. And what's also new, but it's been building up over a much longer time period, is that the planetary conditions of life are radically being transformed uh, what we're calling climate change, but it's much, much more than that. It affects every possible aspect of the life for what we call charismatic megafauna, which is to say big animals, I eat people. So we're in trouble. But think this through. If most people are under 30, does that majority have political power? If you're under 30, ask yourself, do you feel like you're in charge? Do you feel like you're running the show? What would happen if you were? we begin to get some sense of that. We begin to see very young people saying, enough with this climate nonsense, and starting to take direct action, walking out of school, taking action to block government buildings, and so on. We've seen in the United States, high school people taking the lead in opposing the ridiculous regime of guns uh, that we have at present. So we could see then that if the majority did rule, if there was an actual democracy, we would have a very different set of circumstances uh, than the one we, we currently do. But that's not quite where we're at. So let's see what actually happens. So you take a, take a particular example. I'm going to take the example of Brazil because it's a very large country and it's transforming more dramatically perhaps than some of the, of the if you like, the so-called older countries. Brazil now is a paradigm of what I'm talking about. 85% of Brazilians live in cities now. 100 years ago, 2% of Brazilians lived in cities. It's an enormous change. And the cities of Brazil are quite unlike any city that you'll see in Europe. Sao Paulo, with its 20 million inhabitants, it stretches on, and you simply cannot see an end to it. Uh, it go, just goes, it's endless, apparently. Most Brazilians are not just young, they're very young. 62% of Brazilians under 30. And at the same time, highly networked. So there's the fifth largest smartphone market in the world because there's clearly a distinction between having a telephone, we can do SMS and other things, and having a smartphone. Brazil is very much to the forefront of that change. So we saw the first response to this in 2013, a really dramatic uprising in Sao Paulo where people protested the rise in transport fares. And this might seem like a relatively small issue to create massive street protests like this. 
But if you live far out of the city, as most people do, you're taking a private minibus or taxi to get to the end of the train, you're taking a train and then a bus or two buses to get to work. So when they put the price of the ticket up just by a little bit, you're buying four or five tickets a day and you're not making much more than $2 a day, then it's a huge issue. And so we've seen around the world these so-called service provision uprisings in South Africa, for example, over electricity and so on. And these seem then to indicate the flexing, if you like, of the muscle of the new global majority. We demand access to services, sort of fairly basic demand, you would think, and yet has not yet been successful. On the other hand, what we've seen subsequently in Brazil is the election of Bolsonaro last year, and Bolsonaro is a typical new generation strongman, highly opposed to the environment, he's opposed to all form of LGBTQ rights, and he takes a very typical old school dictatorial position in, in Brazil. So the new agenda, if you like, driven by these new social forces does not have a built in impetus to it. It's going to be up to us, particularly those of you who are a part of that global majority, to decide which way it goes. Does it go towards the building of a new global democracy in which the majority are in charge? Or does it go to a new authoritarianism, an authoritarian nationalism, which we're seeing, I think, throughout Europe and indeed the United States in a very strong position at the moment? And we're going to have to think about how that might be contested. So I'm going to think about this then in terms of what the field that I've been associated with over a number of years, which was once called visual culture, now really makes not much sense to make a distinction between something called the visual and something called the culture. Because the culture is saturated with visual media. And you, those of you who are younger will know this more intuitively than those of you who are older. But the numbers themselves are pretty telling. Every minute, 400 hours of YouTube goes up. Every day, 3.5 billion photos get posted to Snapchat. And that's pretty extraordinary because Snapchat's not allowed in China, which is one of the largest single internet markets. So that's the number you're getting to every single day. Six billion hours of YouTube are being watched every month. What are the kind of results we're seeing from that? Kylie Jenner, 20 years old, is a billionaire. How has she done this? She brought together very old-fashioned techniques from shopping TV, where you say, oh my God, there's only 20 of these. You have to, you have to move really quickly because you know, you're not going to get it otherwise. Yeah, in the previous regime of television, 40 or 50 sad late night people are watching this in motels. <laughs> Maybe they managed to sell it out. Kylie has 128 million followers on Instagram alone. So, if, you know, a tiny percentage of her followers respond to this. She's quids in, and so here she is. She's a billionaire, 20 years old. Just to give one like, little, you know, statistical kind of sense of this, Every two minutes, Americans alone take more pictures than were taken in the entire 19th century. So 19th century photography is a pretty big field. You know, in academia, you can't say, I'm going to do the whole 19th century. You have to kind of have a geographical specialism. So are we going to have specialisms of two minutes for people to work on? So clearly, we're not going to be able to do that. We're not going to work in the way that academia used to claim that it works, where we claim to know everything. We have a sort of universal sense of knowledge. Even if we always knew that was a bit fake, now it's totally fake. So what we're doing now is we're working in ways that used to be called postmodern, but are now really clearly a part of this new global situation, where the archive is knowable, but it's only knowable through fragments. It's knowable also, I think, through the classic modernist technique, which we didn't really understand how important it was going to be until the digital came along, which is to say montage. So when you're bringing together items, creating new sorts of knowledge, in exactly the way that Andrea was mentioning before, it's you, the viewer, who is no longer just a passive viewer. You're an active producer of meaning and content who's understanding what there is to be known. And if you want to get a sense of that, I strongly recommend everybody to go to the Arthur Jaffa show that's here in Prague right now. Uh, and see his film, the seven-minute film, Love is the Message. See it about four or five times. 
and you really get a sense of what's going on there. So here's an indication of why this is all going. The sheer number of photographs that were taken, this is the last number that we have that's quasi-official, 1.2 trillion. That means that there were about 3 trillion photographs ever taken by 2012. So every year we're adding a third to all of photography ever. And this, you know, this number might be a lot higher because it basically depends on your guesstimate, how many pictures you take to relative to how many you post. But in a sense, it scarcely matters. It's beyond the counting. It's beyond knowing. What has this meant? It's meant an enormous transformation of the way that capitalism works. Visualized data is the key to the internet, which is quite a big deal these days. You may have noticed and thereby to the circulation of capital itself. And capital, as you remember, needs to circulate to be capital. To be, otherwise, it just becomes money. So our function as you know, so-called consumers or citizens, if you, uh, to give us a grander title, and the planetary democracy is basically one thing, which is to go shopping. And those of you who are a little bit older will remember in 2001, after the planes flew into the towers and everything came to a halt in the United States, the one request that was made of the population by George Bush's government at that time was to go back shopping. Because we had stopped doing that, and the American economy had just stopped. Life hadn't stopped, but the economy did. And the internet has generated new ways of generating circulation. Of Kylie Jenner is, uh, you know, is, is an example of that. This is, I'm take, showing you a slide here from a PowerPoint presentation that was made by a woman called Mary Meeker who is a venture capitalist and an analyst of internet trends. And every year for the last seven or eight years, she's produced these amazingly detailed reports on the futures of the internet. have been extremely influential. So this is her imagining us now when she was writing this in 2016. She was saying, by 28, the end of 2018, we'll be all visual all the time. Now, by this, she means something fairly straightforward. Well, visual culture scholars have kind of agonized over what does the visual mean, what's its difference, what's the difference between the visual and other senses. She just means pictures and video. Now, obviously, video is a complicated thing because it's both sound and images at the same time, and they're all tactile in a certain way. But in the end, I think we know what we mean. When, we, when she says all visual all the time, it makes a certain sense. And this has generated the profitability of the internet. It's funded by and large by advertising, although maybe we are beginning to move to more to a subscription model with Netflix and so on, and that's going to be an interesting thing to see how that plays out. But at the moment, advertising rules and it's driven by visualized data. And I say it that way because World Press Photo has said since 2014 that a camera isn't anything other than what they call a data collecting device. So just as your phone, it calls itself a camera, but it's really imitating a kind of technology to call it that, that it really isn't. It's sampling and collecting data to share and to produce. Now, what happens when advertising works is what I want to call visual unthinking, which is say you don't think. You don't come to, you don't go through a rational process. It appeals to you because why? Because they put a person that you think is attractive to you. And somehow, in some very unthinking way, even though your rational brain knows that there's really no connection between you buying these shoes and looking like the person who's selling them, nonetheless, for that brief moment, you think it's worth a go. I'm going to buy that product. So... We know it's not true, but it works. This is what, you can call this fetishism, if you like, because the, fetishes, the fetishist always knows that the thing that they're fetishistic about isn't really the thing, but nonetheless, they're going to do that. Visual unthinking structures our visual environment. You can't help but be aware of it. So, you know, I noticed, for example, arriving here in Prague, the first thing I see is a, a, church, a church spire, and I think, oh, you know, this is so... This is so Eastern European. And then the next thing I see is the subway. And I can't help but recognize that logo, and I can't help but know what's associated with that because that structural content is so built into our everyday lives now. If you look at photographs of 
Eastern Europe before the fall of communist regimes, one of the most striking things to me is the simple absence of signage. And it makes it really hard to tell, to look at, to see what's exactly in those images. We're so used to triangulating through these images that are presented for us to work our way around. Now, this is, you know, this is a traditional way uh, of thinking about the impact of visual unthinking, but there are other ways that I want to, to outline to you before going back um, to thinking then about visual thinking and how we can counter that. So I'm going to do a quick survey. We have been at war, the United States has been at war since 2001. This is the longest period of war in United States history. It hasn't affected probably most of you because there isn't a draft, but nonetheless, what we are seeing is what visualizing has always been in modern Western history, which is the implementation of technologies of colonialism through visualizing. War is fought by visualizing land from above. At first, in the 18th century, it was the general that did that in his own mind. He's imagining the battlefield because battlefields are too large to see at that point. But very quickly, in the 19th and 20th centuries, technologies were invented to help fight wars like that. First balloons, later planes, and now drones. I'm showing you a drone here uh, at work in Afghanistan. The imaginary of the drone, though, is not in any way confined to war zones. So this is what the Pentagon imagines drones are going to start to do. They call it wide area airborne surveillance. And you can see their imaginary here a wide area is covered by the drone uh, from the camera arrays that are carried on its wings. And to see the difference then, this is what a, what a drone image looks like now. And obviously it's extremely low resolution. They take pictures at two frames a second. They don't take moving video in the way you might imagine because you've seen this in Hollywood. This is not actually how it is. This is what it looks like. So you're making a decision based on those four outlines as to which one of these people you're going to kill. So it's not surprising at all when the wrong people get killed as they so frequently do. This is the future as they imagine it. So what you've got now is this. This is a single feed. The newest planes that I showed you just now do this. It's called the Gorgon Stair, and they have 12 of these, but only one of them is, is even slightly high resolution, which is to say about eight frames a second. The other ones are those two frames a second. But this is what, on the far side, this is what they imagine. And now you, you recognize this. This is Hollywood, right? This is Enemy of the State. This is Homeland. This is all these programs uh, that we see, which we think is the military-industrial complex reality, isn't it? It's their imaginary. It's where they want us to go and live. And because we were already used to it through media, when it happens, we accept it because we thought that was what it was already like. But it isn't. Not yet. But notice what's being scanned here by the Pentagon. This isn't Kandahar. This isn't Yemen. This is LA, actually. They're trying to so what they're imagining is tracking somebody who's run a traffic light, a person, and then you, you get them in broad view and in detail. So, you know, so it's going then, visualizing will be turned from the war zone back to the domestic territory. This then is part of the dissemination of visual capital that I mentioned before, this acceleration of visual images. I want to now turn to a second component of contemporary visualizing, which is the way that we generate that financial capital without intending to by using social media. So Facebook monetizes us. And you'll see that the statistic, I hope you can read this, is that per day, per daily user, Facebook makes about 34 bucks on you. Now, you probably, those of you who are younger are probably thinking, yeah, but I don't use Facebook, so it doesn't apply to me. But you do use Instagram, don't you? <laughs> and you'll see that Instagram is catching up nicely with Facebook, and actually it accounts now for about 30% of Facebook's advertising profit. Because guess what? Zuckerberg owns Facebook and he owns WhatsApp too. So not being on Facebook, being on Instagram, it doesn't matter to them. 
it's still all revenue in the till, as far as they're concerned, and a very significant amount of money, obviously, if you know how much Zuckerberg and people make out of this. So this is a, we have a condition of visualizing as war, we have a condition of visualizing as capital, social media as the source, both of the advertising and through click-throughs, conversion rate, they call it. Literally, when you click on something, somebody somewhere makes two cents. So they don't care if you buy anything necessarily so much. As long as you're clicking on it, somebody somewhere is making money. What do we call this condition? It's not the same as commodity fetishism, the old idea in Marx, right? That the, com the single commodity will make you a different person because we're not, when we're online, we're not necessarily buying things. Well, sometimes we do, but most of the time we don't. Um, and so the theorist Paul Preciado, uh, in his book Testo Junkie, came up with this term, which is a nice term, pharmacopornographic. And what he means by this is something that pornography certainly exemplifies, but it isn't necessarily porn. We are in a culture of the pornification of everything. You know, people talk about food porn, they talk about real estate porn, and so on and so forth. What he's talking then about is, is a circuit of excitation and frustration that is chemically mediated, and that might be caffeine, it might be alcohol, it might be Prozac, it might be tobacco, whatever your thing is, long, you know, a long time before you get to so-called illegal drugs, which is simply a marginal part of the gigantic stimulant industry that we have worldwide. Sugar is a component to that. And the pornographic, then, is the way through which you attempt to resolve this frustration. And it has become reduced to a very simple element of visual unthinking through Tinder. You swipe left, you swipe right. And yes, I know that there's supposed to be a profile attached to Tinder, but do people really read those profiles? Most of the studies that I've looked at seem to suggest that it's a pictorial distinction that's being made where you choose there's, then there's no in-between here. You're yes or you're no. You're picking, you're assembling. And Tinder here is not the exception then. It's the rule. This is how visualized capital works in the post-2008 world. This dramatic set of binaries. And so radical distinction is a principle that operates throughout the social order. And so we're seeing a revival of a much older idea in contemporary authoritarian nationalism, which is the idea of the hierarchy of the human. And this hierarchy says that not all people are fully human, and that that is indexed on ideas of race and ideas of nationality and ideas of radical human difference, which is not to say that these, in other words, in this view, people are inherently different to each other. And there's a 200 year history to this. And so in work like this, this is an early 19th century French text on human nature. And the idea is that this hierarchy of the human goes from the ape to the African person, and at the top, the European or white person, but not symbolized by any particular actual person, but by a Greek statue, the Apollo Belvedere, in this case. Now, it's important to understand that you can't climb this ladder. It's not a ladder with lungs. It's set in stone, quite literally, in the case of the Apollo Belvedere. And when you look at this, you begin to understand one of the reasons why statues and monuments have been so controversial over the last five to ten years. That it's not the statue in and of itself. It's the idea that the statue stands for that there is, or that there should be, a hierarchy of the human. How does this work in actual contemporary life? Here's a really interesting, a striking example of this that's relevant for today because of the whole Brexit crisis. It's a poster that was made by the UK Independence Party right before the Brexit vote in 2016. I don't know if you can read the text, but it says, breaking point, the EU has failed us all. We must break free of the EU and take back control. And what they've done is they've taken a photograph that you can see here of migrants walking across uh, Central Europe. And the original photograph 
which they cropped and compressed here, was actually designed by the photographer, a man called Jeff Mitchell, who works with the Associated Press, uh, to show how well the migrants were organizing themselves, that they didn't need to be policed, that they weren't causing any disorder, they were just quietly walking across the countryside. But zoom in a little bit, crop it, add a caption, and suddenly you have this idea that the UK is being overwhelmed. And this swung the vote. It moved the dial from being slightly pro, staying in the European Union, to being slightly out. And that's how visual media work in contemporary culture. They don't change things permanently. They produce these shifts that last briefly, that excitation, frustration cycle. And this works through uh, categorizing and hierarchizing that I want to call opticality, which you'll be very familiar with. Every time you go to the airport now, they scan your passport, they scan your fingerprints. Everywhere you go in Western Europe and North America, you're being watched by these kinds of machines, closed circuit television cameras here. So, and again, the principle here is that they detect people absolutely as either permissible, acceptable, admissible, or as a threat. And this then is an automated replica of how the police monitor a citizen, how they look at people, and how they quickly classify them. So in the United States, in the Black Lives Matter movement that has been so prominent uh, since 2014, one of the most striking things about these encounters between young African Americans and the police is how short they are. They take almost no time in, in, in this principle of opticality. The police identify a a person as a so-called threat, and they eliminate that threat, to use their own term, very quickly. So in the case of 12-year-old Tamir Rice, the entire encounter between him and the police that ended with his death in Cleveland in 2014 took two seconds. A man called Philando Castile, who was killed in Minnesota, painted here uh, by the African-American artist Henry Taylor, was killed 36 seconds after the police car pulled up behind him. Michael Brown in Ferguson, the whole incident took no longer than 45 seconds. So this distinction, this idea that you, you see it, you like it, you buy it, you click it, also extends to this kind of violence that is, as it were, almost automated, even though humans are involved. It's also important to say that associated with these principles of visualizing and visuality are principles of invisibility and keeping people out of sight. So in both Europe and the United States, now that it explicitly applies to migrants and asylum seekers. So um, this is a camp that I visited in Denmark called Schaasmark, where asylum seekers are detained. And they're kept here in conditions that all the asylum seekers said to me amounted to torture. But they didn't mean torture in the Gestapo sense. It's not pulling fingernails. It's a torture sensory deprivation. There's no furniture allowed, there's no cooking allowed, there's no TV, there's no internet, there's no radio, no wall decorations are allowed, you can't put a picture on the wall. You're just sitting there. You can't work because that's made illegal, you can't claim benefit because that's made illegal. So you sit in a room like this, this is the room in which a climate, an asylum seeker from Eritrea called Eden showed me around. This is where she lives with her seven-year-old son. And what you see here is everything that they have. And they are being kept, then they are being disappeared. They are 25 kilometers outside of Copenhagen. It takes two hours by bus to get to the city, even if they have money to afford that. Even this disappearance has not been sufficient for the Danish People's Party. They now want to move all asylum seekers to stay on a remote island uh, called Lindholm, uh, which is very far from any other, any other city or town. And this is an idea that they're borrowing, again, from Australia uh, much earlier. So visibility and, invis and invisibility create a really significant group of projects that we're going to have to respond to. How can we think back? How can we think back visually as opposed to the unthinking of the two-second response, the immediate firing of a trigger? What we're going to do, what I'm going to do to you here is suggest a few ideas that you could maybe use, a few techniques, a few possibilities that will try and de-visualize 
the state of permanent war that we're currently in. So this is then what I used to call counter-visuality, and now what I call de-visuality. That's to, so it's a mix of decolonizing and counter-visuality to say that we're now going to try and think about specific situated tactical responses to this enormous panoply of visualizing and visual capital that surround us. And I want to think about when we do that, as we begin to think away from the image towards what the South African resistance leader Steve Biko called the envisioned self. That is the self as we would like to be seen, but also as others should see us. What would that look like? So I want to take an example here from Native American poet Lady Long Soldier. She's our Glala Sioux, uh, which is in modern day North Dakota. And this is a poem in her collection, Whereas, and it visualizes this idea of how we might appear to each other. So I'm going to read it from here, just because that's the conventional place to read, but obviously you could start it anywhere. This is how you see me, the space in which to place me. The space in me you see is this place. To see this space, see how you place me in you. This is how to place you in the space in which to see. But there's also a reading, if you like, that I can't say, but you can see and you can, it rhymes without sound, which is here and here and here, which is to say the space in which you and me would encounter each other. Now, the you in the poem is actually the, the white settler, the person come to the United States to colonize. And the me is her, the indigenous subject. So when we're in that space, we don't come there equally. There's an accommodation that I, as a settler, have to make. So I allow her to invent me. That's what I call the right to look. I give her the right to look, the right to look to invent me and to find me and to say what it is that I need to be. And in that space, I say nothing, I wait, I listen. Even and especially if she says nothing. And this is how then we begin to think about encountering each other in what I call space of appearance, where we appear directly to each other. Now this is a non-specific space. She hasn't given us a particular place in a particular time. How that happens in social life is, of course, very much overdetermined by where that encounter happens and on whose terms. So I'm going to give you a few tactics that I've been using to try and make appearance possible. And the first of these is, is, a, is a simple, they're all fairly simple. These are things that you will be familiar with, but I want to assemble them as specific tactics. The idea of persistent looking. And by that I mean then paying attention above and beyond the brief second that it flicks across our feed. But I also mean paying attention to things that are designed to be shocking to us so that we don't stay with it. So state-sponsored violence in particular seeks to reduce the possibility of engagement because it's scary, it's hostile, it's unpleasant. But we should stay with it. So I'm just going to give you a little warning that some of the images coming up may be upsetting, there's nothing graphic, but they may be upsetting. This then is the, perhaps the, you know, the origin of this tactic is Mamie Till Bradley, the mother of Emmett Till, who was killed in Mississippi in 1954 for the alleged offense of whistling at a white woman, which he in fact didn't do as she later admitted at the age of 19. When he had died, he was thrown into the river and his body became grotesquely distorted. And at his funeral, his mother insisted on having an open casket, as you can see here, as she said, for the whole world to see. She posted pictures of Till before his death, standing here in a hat, here he's actually uh, on an early television set, so that people could see the difference. And so what someone like Mamie Till Bradley is asking us to do is not look away despite the very horrifying thing that there is to see here, but to take it on and to, and to realize 
our own implication, our own involvement in that sort of situation. Much more recently, a photograph like this, which is, you remember this perhaps a couple of years ago, the photograph of Alan Kurdi, who is a three-year-old child who was trying to migrate from Turkey to Greece and fell into the water and was drowned and was picked up here uh, by a Turkish policeman. And this photograph went, as they say, viral very quickly. And many people question why this particular photograph did, because sadly, thousands of people have, and children have drowned in the Mediterranean attempting to make this crossing. And I think one of the reasons for that was for Westerners, when you see an image of a person carrying a dead body like this, it evokes the Christian icon of the Pieta, where the Mary, where Virgin Mary is carrying the body of the dead Christ. And whether we are religious or not, we are familiar with that image and we identify with it a little bit. And in so doing, this particular image, as it were, we let it in. Because we're very used to screening out images because there are so many of them coming at us every day and then we just don't have time, we don't have the emotional strength to deal with all the violence that's being shared with us. This one gets through, as it were, very briefly. And what happens when that happens was measured by the social media lab in Manchester, and if there's a tactile and, and visible effect that people start using on Twitter the word refugee and migrant much more than they previously had, but look how brief this effect is. Right? A few days after, it's gone. So persistent looking needs to think about how to make this brief flick of the dial the same way that the breaking point image was able to move the dial. How do we sustain that? How do we work it over the longer period? But one of the tactics that people have used is to take that into social space. And that was particularly a tactic of Black Lives Matter. Activists described how police in the United States still expect African Americans to look down when they encounter police and will punish them if they don't. This is a young man called Le Le a Lamont Record. Sorry, I'm bad with names. I almost forgot it there. Um, he's 16 years old at the time that this picture was taken. He's an LGBTQ activist in Chicago. And he's on a march right after the video of Laquan McDonald, which I'll talk about in a moment, was released and people were protesting in the street. And here then, he's claiming his right to look. He's claiming his right to raise his eyes to the authorities of the police. He's claiming his right to see. He's claiming his right to be a fully empowered citizen and a fully human human being. And the police that's looking back at him, as, as you can see, happens to be African American. Because he is not here as himself. He is here as a representative of systemic white supremacy. And he, as an individual, doesn't matter. He's just a police officer. And that encounter is absolutely they're squared off against each other. Neither of them are going to yield that ground. Because both of them realize that what's at stake here is then who gets to appear in public space. Is public space controlled by the police who tell us, move on, there's nothing to see here, even though we know perfectly well that there is, that's the whole point? Or do we get to control that space? So one of the ways that we might be able to continue the tactic of persistent looking is what the African-American scholar Christina Sharp has called redaction. I was doing it for a while without knowing that's what I was doing, but she gave it this name. And redaction is a very simple crop. You edit out the upsetting part of the image. I want to give you an, an example that may not be obvious to you uh, of redaction. So you will be aware that following Colin Kaepernick, many African-American sports players, particularly in the NFL, have been taking a knee rather than standing with their hand on their heart during the playing of the American National Anthem. And this is the Baltimore Ravens, which is a former star player called Ray Lewis. And notice all the people standing up here, the white guys, not looking tremendously thrilled uh, with what's going on as these players take the knee. Why is the figure of taking a knee been found so offensive to white people, given that it would, you might think, without any social context, it's actually a very humble position. Those of you that watch Game of Thrones will now bend a knee, right? That is the way that you 
the way that you concede power, not the way that you claim power. So why is this seen as a claiming of power? Because it's a redaction. And it's a redaction of an image that is a dominant trope of American racialized history, that of abolition and emancipation. So this is the statue of Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois, and it's showing him as the great emancipator. And here he is freeing the anonymous African enslaved human being here. So what taking a knee has done is it's redacted the emancipator. And it's saying, we are not going to ask you to emancipate us, we are emancipating ourselves. Now, we are evoking then the long history of racialized discrimination in the United States, but now claiming it as something that will be done by those people themselves. They are claiming to be fully human, not requiring the intercession of the great white man to free them. At a simpler level, after a certain point in time with the Black Lives Matter videos that continued to circulate, many people felt they just couldn't look at them anymore, that there were enough black and brown bodies in hurt that had been circulated. And so, nonetheless, I felt it was important that we continue to be aware of these situations and these circumstances. So this operation is a very simple one. I just took the scene in which Laquan McDonald was shot 16 times by a Chicago PD and cut him out of the image. Now, you'll know that very unusually and against the grain of most of these, that cop was recently convicted, uh, and given a very light sentence, though. But what do we see when we look at this? What we see is an apparently abandoned space. There's a lot that's awaiting development from some developer who will probably never come along. There's a bus stop with nobody waiting. There's a sidewalk with weeds that are going through it because nobody cares. No one cares, but someone dies. So this is the space, not of appearance, but the space of non-appearance. This is the space where people may be killed with impunity. This is a space where what happens doesn't matter. And we need to then pay attention to these spaces, whether we are from there or not, because they are being deployed to make political capital. I want to give you an interesting follow-through to this. After the conviction of the police, Jason Dyke, the New York Times published this photograph on its front page, saying that this was the space in which McDonald had been killed. And suddenly it looks completely different, doesn't it? It looks like a more suburban street or a, a, a residential area. But actually what the photographer has done is, by using his focus, he's compressed what's actually a four-lane highway and made it look like it's a relatively narrow street and chosen a very sharp angle to make it look very different to what it actually did. I went on Google Street View the same day. This is the spot where Laquan McDonald was killed. That's the same lot that's still waiting to develop. The bus stop, okay, it's got a shelter now. But there's a real difference between imagining that this is where African Americans in Chicago are being shot by the cops, and this is. And so then these relatively simple visual awarenesses cropping, checking, camp, looking and seeing what, how our digital databases might allow us to understand images that are circulated for us, not taking it for granted. So being persistent and redacting at the same time. In short, I want to give you an, a, a, an ending idea that we are not sinking, we're falling. And falling is a good thing. So you'll remember and get up that now become a phrase that's entered the language. The sunken place that the photographer Chris gets sent. The sunken place, Jordan Peele has said, is a metaphor for the system of mass incarceration in which 2.3 million people in the United States, the majority of whom are white, but disproportionately people of color, are confined and contained. But also, I think it refers to the long history of transatlantic slavery. How then can we avoid the sunken place. And I want to suggest that it's not by rising, but by falling. We know certain ideas. This comes out of Standing Rock, where Lady Long Soldier wrote her poem. Here, the idea that the human is the dominant falls. 
Water is life, not humans. The land owns us. We don't own it. So we have to pay respect to it. In other words, instead of this hierarchy of the human, we place the human in a relative position to all forms of life. To quote from Fred Moten and Stefano Hani in their book, The Undercommons, which I recommend to you all, to fall is to lose one's place. To lose the place that makes one, to relinquish the locus of being, which is to say, of being single. So what Fred, who's also a poet and prize-winning poet, and Stefano mean by this is that they have this idea that we should consent not to be a single being. In other words, that I, I don't see by myself. I only see in exchange with you. That as you and I appear and we come together, we create something common that we share, that is formed in that moment, and it's not singular, it's not ownable, it's not one. And that is to fall. In the biblical sense, if you like, the fall away from the singular monotheism that structures the, what the African-American philosopher Sylvia Winter has called monohumanism. And the image is part of that because the image is actually from the Latin imago dei, the image of God. It's singular. It's monocultural, monohuman, monotheist. Now we're thinking about falling from that place but to relinquish that being to become something more, something that connects and something that binds us together. We've seen this in social life over the last several years. In Tahrir, the demand was the people want the regime to fall. The people in this case, not a single entity, but the people in the square who claim to be the people of Egypt by their putting their bodies in public space where it was not supposed to be. Mubarak chased them with soldiers, with camels. 800 people died in defense of this right to appear, this right to claim public space to make the regime fall, which it briefly did. But as we've seen, it re restored itself. In other words, we don't win forever. You win, but then you go back to work because you, have, you only have that brief space in which you've influenced what's going to happen in this incredibly complex conjuncture that we're in. Here's another form. This is a group called BYP 100, Black Young People 100, who have pulled down a mass-produced Confederate statue called Silent Sam here. And they just simply attached a plastic rope to it and they pulled it and it fell. This is right after... Charlottesville. This then is the action of the young global majority. All these folks are well under 30, acting in a different kind of politics to that which Obama, for example, preached to them of respectability politics, of staying in school, of being good, of not causing trouble. And yet this had a more, this shifted the dial in terms of the public representation of the Confederacy, of the Confederate flag, and of monuments in general, far more effectively than any of those things. And finally, just to leave you with one thought. These statues, monuments, the condition of permanent war, the condition of permanent capital, is what Fennell called the aesthetics of respect for the established order. Statues exemplify that, in Fanon's view, because we live in a world of statues where we're not supposed to move, where there's a binary distinction between me and you, us and them, and that must be sustained at all costs. And against that, I want us to become ungovernable. You, the young majority, in which we then finally appear to each other in the way that we wish to be seen, in the way that we would like to be beheld, in the way that others would like to apprehend us, in the form then of a the idea of a beginnings of a possible democracy in which, for the first time, all the people are part of the people. What does that look like? It looks like this. It looks like bearing each other up against the risk of sinking. And this is the film Moonlight, which you, I'm sure you've all seen, uh, in which 
gang leader is teaching the young boy, Blue, how to swim. And in that moment, the camera is right in the water. It's right at the level, right between sinking and falling. And it's buoyed up by the fact that he is here to support his other, to give him that gift, right? And that is then the possibility of a democracy that is yet to come, but is entirely possible. I'm done. <laughs>